Uh, well, the, the topic uh, I would like to address uh, today is about legal interoper interoperability of shared data. Um, of course, uh, it's just a preliminary approach and uh, also um, uh, some, there are some interesting topics that, that I would like to, to, uh, to highlight. And of course, thank you uh, uh, to the Ethics and Law and Policy Subgroup for this opportunity. About the GEO, please let me let me refer that GEO is an, is an intergovernmental partnership working to improve the availability, access, and use of open Earth observation, uh, among which there's satellite imagery, remote sensing, and situ data to impact policy and decision making in a wide range of areas. Uh, some uh, discussions has, has led that uh, se uh, some uh, priority areas to, to uh, be taken into account, uh, refer to sustainable development goals, uh, the climate action, disaster re reduction, and urban resilience. And also, there are some geo data sharing principles that I would like to uh, highlight. Uh, in, two, in 2016, uh, the ministers endorsed uh, a new set of data sharing principles, uh, promoting open data by default. Also, in 2019, uh, ministers endorsed the Canberra Declaration. And, and in that uh, initiative, uh, the governments uh, were encouraged to increase free access to Earth observation created using uh, public resources. And also, uh, and it was uh, fostered to reinforce uh, inter the international recognition on open EO uh, data uh, to address environmental challenges. So as far as the legal interoperability of shared data is concerned, uh, there are some legal options for the exchange of data through the GEO's data core. Also the GEO legal interoperability subgroup data sharing task force uh, in 2011 is important to, uh, to mark this, uh, this event. Also the report on data sharing principles post 2015, which features the mechanisms to ensure uh, the legal interoperability of shared data through the GEOs. And also in 2014, the GEO data sharing working group has developed initiatives that uh, are important uh, to date, right? So uh, the legal mechanism uh, to share data as part of the GEO's data core. Uh, refer that uh, there are some GEO members and participating organizations that uh, should consider the adoption of uh, some of the uh, existing voluntary waivers of standard common use licenses compatible with the GEO's data core information. Of course, it has uh, this, this topic as far as I understand or as inferred from this, some, uh, some uh, reference to, uh, to intellectual property protection and so on. So uh, these standards are, are uh, as voluntary waivers are so important because it refers to the Creative Commons Public Domain Mark, statutory waiver of copyright, Creative Commons uh, Public uh, Domain Waiver, CCO, and also uh, Open Data Commons uh, Public uh, Domain Dedication and License, and the Creative Commons Attribution License. Those four, or uh, well, five actually, are, are very important. Any of the mechanisms recommended above will reinforce the interpretation <coughs> sorry, of G GEO's data sharing principles favoring open access and unrestricted reuse of data. Then uh, as far as the legal interoperability of shared data uh, is concerned, in 2016 marked uh, the existence uh, of the legal interoperability of research data, principles and implementation guidelines by the RDA uh, CODATA, uh, Legal Interoperability Interest Group. And among, uh, as, as a brief, um, um, conclusion of, of such uh, uh, fact is that um, these, um, uh, guidelines uh, facilitate uh, lawful access and reuse of research data. Also, they determine the rights and uh, to and the responsibilities of the data, they balance the legal interest, and also state the rights transparently and clearly. Also, promote the harm harmonization of rights in research data, and they provide proper attribution and credit for research data as well. 
uh, again, uh, the coordinating uh, Earth Observation Open Data Policies and Contract uh, practice is, Practices is also an important topic to bear in mind because despite uh, prior GEO and RDA recommendations, only 50% of the GEO member governments established national open data regulations and policies that enable agencies to freely share Earth Observation data. The GEO uh, Working Group on Ethics, Law and Policy subgroup uh, is developing a draft work plan to review these recommendations, assess the barriers, and offer practical recommendations for implementation. Um, I would like to uh, open the floor uh, in order to uh, to name or to refer uh, some uh, legal instruments that could be taken into account. But we should not forget, first of all, uh, as a supranational body, the United the work of the United Nations. So I thank uh, the uh, Geo Secretariat for the guidelines in this regard. So the Rio Declaration on Environment and Development uh, fosters, among other uh, principles, international cooperation also refers to sustainable uh, development. Also, uh, thank you for uh, pointing out the Aarhus Convention uh, that refers to the access to environmental information and public uh, participation. Also, uh, the uh, Skazu Convention uh, concerning Latin America and Caribbean is also a legal instrument that should be taken into account. And there are uh, many other le legal instruments that are really important in this regard. So I would like to focus uh, uh, just to open the floor for discussion uh, as, as much as, uh, as you consider to some legal instruments that could be taken into account from a European perspective, right? Uh, one of them is the INSPIRE Directive uh, that was enacted back in 2007. Uh, such directive uh, fosters the interoperability, interoperability of data, uh, meaning by uh, data uh, can be um, shared and worked uh, without any problem of, of interpretation. So uh, the computer system and systems are capable uh, to refer to uh, such data and to obtain information there from the data sets. Also, uh, the, uh, the, and the so-called access directive uh, that was um, repealed by the directives uh, from uh, 2018, referring uh, to the electronic communications. That directive refers also to uh, the fact that data shall be interoperable. So as, uh, as a whole harmonization uh, effort, those two instru instruments are very important to bear in mind. Last but not least, uh, uh, there's also one um, kind of recent uh, legal instruments in the European Union that was enacted back in, in 2019. Uh, it, that is the Directive on Open Data and the Reuse of publics, uh, inf, uh, the Public Sector Information. Uh, this directive um, focuses on the economic aspects of the reuse of information rather than access to information by citizens. Uh, this uh, information has been observed, obtained from a, from a source from the Euro uh, European uh, uh, Commission uh, in an is initiative referring to the shape of, uh, digital, of Europe's digital future. Uh, then uh, this uh, directive encourages the member states to make as much information available for use as possible and addresses some issues like uh, material held by public sector bodies in the member states at national and other levels such as ministries, state agencies and municipalities, as well as organizations funded mostly by or under the control of public authorities. So as transposed in, uh, in July 2021, this directive is pretty recent. So uh, finally, I would like to thank, uh, in order to conclude, to conclude my, my, my presentation, I would like to thank uh, the, uh, the, the opportunity uh, to my colleagues at, at the Ethic uh, Law um, Policy Subgroup. Uh, and on behalf of them, I thank you for, for this thanks, and I hope you, uh, you have um, uh, obtained some valuable information from this presentation. So please, uh, you have the floor now. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for your presentation and uh, this introduction. Um, we're now um, still uh, 
uh, waiting for the next speaker, but probably, um, unfortunately, he will not be able to attend us now. So um, let me, for, for the moment, uh, ask if we have any questions from the audience regarding your presentation. Okay, so um, so I hear no. Uh, let me check the chat. Um, okay, so um, so before that, um, let me let let me ask you one uh, one question. So you have uh, uh, introduced some legal instruments. Um, I see that uh, interoperability in Earth data is uh, one of the crucial points, and uh, this uh, this is um, something that we're um, missing for quite a long time already because uh, of our because geo data is usually is uh, very complex and uh, requires uh, a very precise uh, metadata. So do you, uh, so what, what do you think, if we will take into account their, our new virtual reality and machine learning algorithms that should be uh, probably widely applied, uh, if not now, but in next decade, uh, what is our legal instrument for interoperability? How we can uh, achieve this? Uh, yeah, thank you for your question. That's a very good, good question because uh, it demands an effort uh, from the legislator. So as far as I, uh, as a practitioner, as far as I would understand the whole, uh, the whole situation of, uh, of open data and the, uh, the advent of uh, artificial intelligence and all the new regulations that are coming out, uh, at least uh, in Europe. So um, we need to reach to a harmonized and, and a standardized uh, type of um, a legal framework uh, as far as law and policy in order to, because it's important that um, uh, to prevent uh, legal gaps, it's important to harmonize initiatives, it's important to smooth uh, communications. So if we have a, a, a type of um, self-aware uh, uh, computer, uh, let's put it this way, some kind of uh, decision ma making capabilities that will be perhaps transferred uh, to a computer. Uh, the par parameters that uh, such computer uh, or such uh, computer system should have in mind must be very uh, clear, uh, simple, and also easy to, to apply without uh, a, at least the minimum doubt of, of, of confusion, because there are so many uh, stakeholders in this regard, such as uh, international organizations, states, so many interests, but that, that some uh, in um, like uh, standard mechanisms should be, uh, be taken into account in this regard, without forgetting uh, uh, the uh, the state of some countries uh, that, are, that I quote developing, but uh, of course I'm not very fond of this term, but their technology uh, not as uh, developed as some others because of whatever opportunities uh, they had. Um, I would uh, need to focus on that and to stress that point because uh, there are some uh, some initiatives that should be taken into account in order to harmonize the, the situation of the whole planet, especially since uh, humankind will uh, go to other celestial bodies and to uh, start other types of, of protocols and activities in outer space. So I hope I uh, answer more or less. Mm -hmm. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, I have our, um, another question. Uh, first of all, I'm, I'm very happy to see Gilberto Camara to join our session today. Uh, Gilberto, you have a question, so please. Yes, hello, good morning to everyone, good day to everyone. So I, I mean, first of all, it's uh, to comment uh, Jordi and others on this and of course the code data. So I'm going to refer to some of the points that Jordi is making about uh, the shared data. And uh, it's just a comment to start a dialogue with begs a question. Um, the, the issue I would like to raise concerns the uniqueness of Earth observation data. 
in this uniqueness by, by the following point. There are essentially two kinds of data that we refer to when we refer to uh, first observation data. And these two are very different. The first one is the data provided by the satellites, which is subject to the IP rights by the data providers. So if uh, Copernicus uh, makes its data available, it assigns an IP right to that. Now, what has been found through decades of use of that is that that data is best used in combination with what we call by lack of a better name in situ data. And in situ data corresponds to the samples which are used to tell the data, uh, well, this is uh, corn, this is forest, this is savannah, whatever. Now, the two uh, are not, I mean, each one has different origins and therefore it, it different legal frameworks. So in which sense, perhaps you could uh, refer to, that's for question one, refer to in the, in your refinement of the lingual interoperability. And the other point is, uh, the second question is whether you could extend your work to software. Let me explain why I'm asking the second question. The fact that you have a data set covering the planet, satellites, does not, the data doesn't speak, right? You have to make it speak and the make it speak is to use the software. So therefore, uh, arguably, a software is a complement to the existing data and could, if possible, be taken into account by those that cover the legal framework. So should your legal framework be also uh, constructed in a way that to, to discuss the use of software? So thank you very much, Jody, and these are my two questions. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Gilberto, for uh, these wonderful questions. I mean, they're so important. Um, well, um, I would like uh, first to refer to the work of some Brazilian jurists that he has done an amazing work concerning uh, the, uh, the uh, remote sensing in this regard. Uh, but uh, his name is uh, Jose Montserrat Filho. He, he, he has developed so many initiatives in this regard. Uh, but first, let me address the first question as, as asked um, by the secret secretariat in this regard. Of course, satellite data and in situ data, um, there's uh, uh, these structures are so important we, because we have uh, satellites orbiting planet Earth and, and capturing information. In this regard, uh, the Copernicus regulation, we have a 2014 Copernicus regulation uh, that is in, uh, into force and it refers to sensitive data and, uh, and open data and also uh, the availability of data to stakeholders. And also we have in situ data. Uh, in this regard now comes to my mind the difference between uh, Air law and space law. So when we go and refer to satellites orbiting planet Earth, we we refer to the lack of jurisdiction because outer space, as as far as I understand, is a res communis. In Latin, is an area that belongs to the whole uh, humankind. So in this regard, the Bogota Declaration that happened in the Copus Legal Subcommittee referred uh, to the possibility to balance uh, uh, the state uh, of the status of all uh, member states of the UN. In what happens with uh, uh, below the Karman line, which is the line that divides airspace and outer space. Below the Karman line, uh, which uh, could be placed uh, above 100 kilometers above the sea level. So what happens with uh, the Carmen line? The Carmen line then uh, marks the distinction between air law and space law. In this regard, since outer space uh, can be subject to no appropriation and states uh, have only jurisdiction and control of the uh, space objects uh, and the missions they carry, uh, air law uh, could be defined by uh, the, the internal, internal laws of the states operating the in situ sensors. For instance, we have uh, we can place uh, remote sensors uh, and that capture information of planet Earth or concrete areas in buoys, uh, ships uh, uh, that that capture data concerning the, the bathymetry, uh, biochemistry, temperature, current tides, uh, you, you name it. Also, uh, you have uh, airborne remote sensing, balloon uh, uh, remote sensing, many devices that uh, can 
be used in this regard. So as far as IP rights, uh, if we refer to the internal laws of this of the states, uh, every state has uh, their own laws. Uh, and of course, we have the Berna Convention, we have to come from above as well. But and bear in mind all that. And also, for instance, in Spain, we have our internal law that regulates uh, and protects uh, the inventions. And of course, thanks to the Berna Convention on Copyright, our, for instance, musical work can be protected, or some imagery can be protected worldwide as far as that convention is concerned. Also, <clears throat> To what extent could be uh, enact an international document uh, referring uh, to data sets and also uh, that um, that manages uh, to to regulate uh, the software as well. So um, as far as I, I, I know, there's this um, the United Nations resolutions on resolution on remote sensing. I think it was enacted back in 1986, and of course such. Uh, such resolution per se um, is a soft law instrument. As far as a resolution is not has not a binding force, but such a resolution refers to data uh, that could be under, understood as uh, raw data. Then there's also the analyzed uh, data or analyzed information using certain types of software, of course. And also we have the processed data and the evaluated data that that can uh, that that turns this raw data and telemetry coming from satellites and it uh, transforms or, and, and it uh, elaborates such data into the desired information we would like to obtain, either uh, a database compilation or an image, so to speak. So for instance, any uh, consulting company on environmental law can have uh, uh, his image to apply. And this, this uh, issue is so important for uh, legal proceedings in the protection, not only the environment, but human right protection. So the ICG, the International Court of Justice, have elaborated uh, some uh, in their, in their uh, judgments, have elaborated some discussions concerning uh, and some, just, uh, some reasoning concerning the applicability of satellite data uh, for the protection of human rights. This is so important because satellites can uh, uh, capture information of areas and regions where the uh, UN troops cannot uh, reach there. So um, I hope I, I answer more or less. I'm sorry if I extend myself. So thank you, Gilberto. Thank you very much. Um, so since we're missing Stefano on TV, um, let me ask uh, one question. Jordi, are you available to present his slides? Uh, oh, you're muted, you're muted. Sorry. <laughs> yes, I can do that, uh, it shouldn't be a problem. Thank you, thank you very much. So uh, let's uh, come to our next presentation. Jordi, the floor is yours again. Thank you. Again, uh, thank you so much. Uh, I'll go on. Um, I hope, yes, uh, you can see the screen. And um, uh, yes, well, uh, the uh, the second session raises questions. Uh, please do not take do not take uh, the following information as a statement, but uh, uh, it raises questions that could be important to address to the audience in order to uh, start like and open the floor the floor for discussions. In this regard, the geo um, uh, and legal policy and ethical uh, subgroup of the geo data working group might explore possible challenges and. And, and opportunities. So it's it's quite important uh, as a goal to um, to uh, determine and to highlight that uh, exploring the potential and legal privacy and ethical issues for GEO members uh, and GEO user and cloud computing providers, uh, we could uh, bring out this idea in order to work on, on this. And also the objective, the initial ob objective uh, from a tentative perspective uh, could be to develop proposed principles and guidelines to help and ensure that the users that are fully aware of the implications of their utilization of cloud-based services and that the interests of the geo community as a whole are reflected in future partnerships established under the geo umbrella. 
Also, uh, and I would like to open the floor for discussion uh, of possible deliverables of the of the current state of the of the subgroup, because um, it could be interesting to to develop an anal an analysis of the end user license agreement and the terms of use of some of the most prevalent cloud uh, service providers, considering the questions and topics uh, as described, and also other topics that might come out of interest, because we should not uh, forget that that uh, as, as far as technology is evolving, evolving and also the uh, the community uh, is, uh, is bringing out some topics, we should take them into account as much as we can in this regard. And also, finally, uh, this uh, presentation will be a bit short. Uh, the best practice, uh, practices and vision could be um, like uh, applied into a, docu a document, and and that could guide. Uh, if in pre, uh, at the beginning, perhaps uh, the geo secretariat when reviewing any specific uh, terms of service, but I don't know, perhaps this is too much, uh, too presumptuous to, to have, but at least it would be interesting to, since of course, uh, geo doesn't have, uh, well, uh, is in kind of as his agreement of, of cooperation with the WMO uh, in this regard. Uh, so then it would be uh, interesting to uh, at least to, to ask whether it, this would be necessary when reviewing any specific EULA terms of service from a proposed cloud services provider uh, partner. So uh, those statements, I, even though they are kind of strong, perhaps uh, it would be interesting to, to, to start a discussion on that. But of course, uh, it's, uh, it depends on the, on the quorum of the whole group, uh, which I thank very much for the, for the opportunity. So uh, this uh, could be, it. Uh, again, uh, thanks for your kindness. Uh, thank to all the members for this opportunity and I hope uh, you have a great uh, session today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, okay, uh, so um, may I ask uh, Gilberto uh, if you can uh, now proceed with your comments. So the floor is yours, so. Thank you, uh, thank you, Jordi, thank you. So uh, I think this is uh, always important. Uh, the, the quality of the members of the ethics uh, legal policy subgroup is, is a clear gain to GEO in general, and of course, in particular to the GEO secretariat, which as uh, Jordi said, we rely on the WMO legal counsel. We don't have a legal counsel because GEO tries to be slim and therefore uh, inputs from uh, experienced uh, experts on law and intellectual property law, research data, space law are most welcome. Now, just for information for everyone, we are now uh, have about um, mostly like 70 grantees and five, yeah, about this 65 to 70 grantees already uh, onto our program, and uh, maybe we will, and uh, our plan is to continue. So we have a practical uh, experience now from the grantees in terms of their use of the cloud credits and the limitations thereby. Uh, up to this moment, the Geo Secretary has not been informed of any limitations of uh, that have applied to privacy or to uh, the intellectual property of any grantee. Of course, uh, lawyers and experts on, 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 on rights and properties have different visions and it would be most welcome if you could select uh, a number of, uh, of those uh, to highlight in terms of best practices. But uh, the nature of what is granted is important. We, uh, of course, the main concern on privacy stems from very concrete examples from like uh, getting user preferences on Facebook in terms of, of say voting and then targeting specific campaigns to those subgroups of users. And this is, of course, you saw that in Cambridge Analytica scandal. And that is an enormous and serious concern for democracy and for our, our, our world. Uh, in so far as the grants are concerned, from the legal point of view, 
in terms of what we could see, not being lawyers, uh, there has been no infringement of IP rights, either on the software which is used by the people who use the grants, for example, to access an Amazon virtual machine or a Google uh, service by them, by the communities. So I'm going to give you one example of a particular case where uh, my institution or my, my alma mater in P has a grant and they have used Amazon to process, they essentially use Amazon to process data so that that data is actually hosted, not in Amazon right now, but on a specific infrastructure that is in Brazil called Brazil Data Group, which is a specific kind of processing. So it's a reprocessing of the Amazon data, which actually is not an Amazon data that's in Amazon from Copernicus and Landsat and put in Brazil Data Group. And the data is there. You can Google Brazil data, Google or whatever. You can Bing or, or Doc, whatever, whatever, Brazil data cube, and you get there. Now, that data, which sits on Brazil data cube, has not, I mean, it's processed in Amazon, but it's completely under the control of a national institution that covers a country, Brazil. It's really under the control of national institution. Obviously, the data follows uh, the rules of being everything being available. Uh, the software that was used to process the data was developed by the institution. And, and there was not a single moment when we, when the, the witnesses, any kind of infringement of say, oh, Amazon is going to use this or the data is ours and so on and so forth. So it's important to consider that there are concrete examples uh, already. And we have Costa Rica, which also does, I mean, the, the, it goes from the Amazon to the Himalayas. So it it's really goes from Indonesia to, to Belize and then to New Zealand and to Vietnam. I mean, this is really uh, Kenya, South Africa, Nigeria, you name it. So a lot of countries and a lot of specific situations. So it would be most welcome that the group would do that. We understand, and that's very important, that from a international organization point of view, the best possible situation would have to have one or many global commons. When I mean global commons, I mean places where public data is available, that open source software is available to explore the data, and that the knowledge that is accrued by using that is shared globally. We don't have a global commons, I would argue yet. We have initiatives which are very interesting and also a part of GEO and should be studied. One example is the Digital Earth Africa initiative, which is very valuable and should be considered by the group. There is also the FAO initiative funded by Norway, which is called CIPO which is basically for forest management, but is available to FAO countries, which are part of, of course, tropical forests. Again, we don't have a global, maybe we have a coalition of small commons which are accessible. Obviously, this situation from an international organization point of view, it, it's much more comfortable because it, it gives uh, much more stronger assurances to countries, to institutions, to researchers, to those involved, that, that they're really working on something which is, you know, uh, abides by not the rules, because I don't think there's a problem with the rules of Microsoft. It's the principles of sharing that are inherent to the necessity of our globe today. So I think it's, it's important that to say that the any agreements with these companies are not an end on itself, but it's a step towards this idea of global commons. So, uh, well, thank you very much for the opportunity. And I think, Jordi, yes, please continue. There are lots of questions that need to be asked, uh, including how to set up the best practices, which would be absolutely welcome by uh, the Secretary and certainly the member states and participating organizations.
Thank you. Thank you very much, Gilberto, for your comments. Um, I think that it's uh, increasingly important to have our unique data sharing principles because we're now uh, uh, not able to uh, accept many uh, many of them. I mean, we should be uni united by the way we define open data, by the way we define open science. And I think that we learned a lot from pandemic uh, of how important it is right now. Um, and uh, yes, we're still missing global, uh, global expertise, global voice, uh, from not only one organizations, but uh, from the way we can collaborate between each other. Um, so I'm uh, asking again uh, if we have any questions from the audience. Uh, I see that uh, we have a question from uh, Massimo. Yes, uh, thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you, Jordi and Gilberto, for, for, for the presentation and the comments. Um, I guess I think indeed it's it's a very important set of questions that we should ask. I mean, in, in the first instance, whether in a way the, the the very important geos data sharing principle should be enhanced or complemented also by geo ethical principles on the on the on the sharing of data on the use of data, uh, and that is an open question uh, because uh, in a way. Uh, where there are also the experiences of the geo secretariat in setting up the agreements with the cloud providers and indeed of the grantees in using such grant provider give us opportunities to uh, to define some guidelines some principles that can be more generalized and then can provide you know be an advocacy for for for, for the broader geo community so i think that there's value uh, even just from the lessons that have been learned in, in maybe generalizing and extracting this, these broader principles in the same way, way as we have done with the data sharing principle. Uh, more to the specific, I think that it's very important as, as, um, uh, as Gilberto, Gilberto was saying that, uh, you know, sort of the data um, that users, uh, um, uh, scientific users of, of, the, of, of the cloud platforms provide to the cloud platforms together with models, algorithms, these, uh, once they're processed, they can also be re-extracted, they can be used, they can be shared. And it's very important that I know that already the agreements that are in place uh, make sure that that is the case and, and, and that is very valuable. We should not, however, forget another aspect that we know that uh, you know, the, the, the economy, the cloud economy, the platform economy, is very much based not just from uh, the data that is provided voluntarily by, by, by users, uh, but also the data that is uh, provided uh, de facto. And, and that is includes the personal data of me as a user when I have to log in into any of the platforms, uh, I have to use my credentials. Uh, and it is those credentials uh, together with any personal information that can be mashed through different different data that is actually then repackaged and resold to third parties. And that is what is underpinning the, uh, the economy of platforms. So, you know, when we talk about user data, we should be very clear what we are talking about. There is the scientific data that we upload together with algorithm or to reuse existing algorithm in order to extract uh, a, a, a processing and an analytical question. And then there is the personal data that any user uh, would need to, uh, to provide in order to access those services as I do in on many platforms. And I think that we need to be clear that we don't, we don't uh, um, mix the two. Um, and from that point of view, I think that there is at least a question to be asked whether any of that personal data of the login nature uh, that is no longer done on Geos, but is done on commercial platform, that is basically reused as it's the normal practice of, of, com of, uh, of commercial companies. Uh, and so I think that there are clearly a number of things that we need to tease out. And as I said, uh, uh, analyze both the experiences of existing users, the experiences of, uh, of uh, 
the broader uh, platform economies and, and, and understand whether there are generic principles that, uh, that uh, could be extracted. And thank you very much for the group to volunteer to take, to take this work on. Thank you very much, Massimo. Do, uh, do you have uh, any uh, comments uh, to this? Um, yes, um, if you allow me, thank you, thank you, Massimo, for uh, this explanation. Yes, it's it's very important. Uh, be, this proves, uh, as this is a personal remark, or for of course, this this proves that um, that uh, sciences, science, and law, and 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 I must uh, come together in this regard. We need to have like a technical. Uh, a legal approach, uh, perhaps at the same time, that would be desirable. Uh, especially, I'm just uh, giving the floor of uh, uh, to the audience uh, to these uh, these two examples. Uh, we have uh, um, like a, an, is an initiative on standards, for instance, uh, the one developed by the uh, the OGC, uh, the o uh, Open Geospatial Consortium, concerning the implementation of some standards like the S121, uh, which has some uh, environmental uh, connotations and by limiting uh, the uh, the uh, I mean the, the spatial limits according to the uh, to the United Nations Convention of the law of the sea and also we need to bear in mind uh, efforts uh, from a commercial perspective as carried by the uh, uh, the ICC interna international uh, uh, commercial chamber in this regard because we have the inco terms uh, somehow so uh, this uh, like tendency or to to standardize uh, some initiative why not extending uh, such initiative uh, to the data and the cloud data in this regard so uh, but again it's it's a really uh, strong effort for the legislator and the stakeholders because uh, we need to bear in mind how long does it take to enact an international body uh, for instance as a uh, European regulations such as uh, a directive of course it has to uh, go through many many stages and at the end it can be uh, for instance withdrawn if it's not uh, correctly motivated as, as, it, as it happened uh, sadly with the proposal uh, for the high resolution uh, uh, data uh, dissemination high resolution data so again uh, uh, we need to establish perhaps uh, this is of, of course a personal remark in my opinion it would be desirable to establish some uh, some uh, like a roadmap of of which would be the uh, the most convenient approaches to bear in mind, but of course this has to be submitted to the whole group. Uh, this was just a personal again a personal opinion uh, on, on your comments, but thank you so much. Thank you very much for your comments. Um, so, do we have any other questions? Uh, or probably topics for discussion. We have uh, um, a bit less than 15 minutes uh, before we end our session. I think that uh, during uh, today's session, we had uh, a lot of interesting discussions and uh, probably a lot of uh, topics that we better get back to geo data working group uh, and uh, provide with some answers because uh, we um, were now on the way to focus on three main uh, objectives actually that we should to advocate uh, the importance of our uh, data sharing principles. We need to engage uh, with the stakeholders, with their uh, other communities. And this is what also was mentioned by Gilberto. And we need to deliver data, deliver information and deliver our knowledge to community. I think that there are still a lot of issues that, uh, as well as data security, I think that we something that we're uh, um, missing right now, but uh, for we're on the way to to make new instruments to protect us, to protect our data as well, but still keep it open and share as as it possible. Um, Okay, so um, if we have no 
other questions? Okay, okay. So uh, if not, uh, I wish to uh, thank you all to joining our session today. And Jody, thank you very much for giving the presentations uh, and to join the discussions. Uh, so thank you everyone. And please enjoy the rest of your day wherever you are and the rest Joe sessions. <laughs>